All right, welcome into our 6.4 notes today for imperialism in Africa. This is part of our larger unit on uh, European imperialism as a whole, but this is really focused on the African continent and the scramble for Africa. So again, when we talk about Africa prior to imperialism, we're talking about a very, very diverse continent. Uh, you can take a look at the map over there on the right. We're talking about over 1,000 different language or ethnic groups around uh, the continent, and that these groups would have been, again, very culturally diverse. Uh, within this, you have small independent villages, but you also have these very large empires, especially ones uh, with uh, access to uh, the coast, especially in the east. You've got these uh, trading empires along the Swahili coast in West Africa. You've got these empires uh, that were rich from gold. North Africa and Southern Africa also have their own uh, trading kingdoms, uh, as well as in Central Africa. You've got, again, rich culture, rich history within the entire continent. The other thing that made Africa a little bit different than other continents at this period of time is the fact that it was essentially cut off until the mid-1850s. One of the main reasons for this was geographically Africa was very, very hard to navigate. And the reason for this is the fact that the coasts of Africa uh, were relatively flat, but then they would jut up to this these high plateaus, uh, which made it very difficult to travel, as well as the fact that many of the rivers in Africa have lots of waterfalls or cataracts along them, so it's not as if a boat could travel upstream the entire way. The thing is, is that as technology starts to get better because of the Industrial Revolution and the discovery of natural resources within Africa becomes apparent to Europeans, everything changes and there is a mad dash to colonize this continent. And this race becomes known as the Scramble for Africa. Basically, by 1870, you have a bunch of countries within Europe that have industrialized. They have the means to get into the interior of Africa. They also need the resources there, and they want to set up these colonies. The problem is, is that the Europeans oftentimes have these issues where uh, competition leads to warfare, and war is bad for business. So what happens is the European powers, they meet in Berlin for what's known as the Berlin Conference. And they basically meet up to establish rules on how they get the power to divide up Africa, set up colonies, and the kind of rules of engagement for these European powers as they're competing with each other. So again, kind of setting up rules as they see fit. At this meeting, we've got about 14 different European countries. The heavy hitters are the same people we've talked about through most of the year, Britain, France, Germany, Portugal. Uh, Belgium is also involved in this, uh, and we'll talk more about them later. A relatively younger country compared to the others, but also very industrialized. The glaring thing is that African rulers are not invited to this meeting. This is a European conference, not an African and European conference. Europe decides that they're going to take control of this continent, okay? And you can really see this when you look at just the size of territory that's controlled. Europeans controlled about 10% of territory in Africa in 1880, that it was under colonial power in one way or the other. About 30 years later, you have Europeans controlling uh, all but two countries on the entire continent, Liberia and Ethiopia. So again, this is really what it looks like in 1878. If you look at the territory that's in the kind of uh, beige brown, you're looking at independent states, these areas that are not colonized. But by the time we get to 1914, you can see how it's been carved up for these different powers throughout Europe. Now, this looks different depending on which type of European power we're talking about. Direct control was commonplace, and it was commonplace especially amongst uh, the French colonies. This is where European officials would be placed in the colonies, 
and they would be the ones that ran the government. So someone from France would move to the colony, they would run the government directly. This meant that indigenous people that lived there, they did not get to make decisions about what was going on, they did not get to rule themselves. And this is not only in Africa, but it's also in Asia. We see two terms that connect back to this idea of direct control. Paternalism, this idea that Europeans uh, feel the need to run these countries like parents do. And you can kind of think about this from the standpoint that your parents are expected to provide you as a child with the basic needs and necessities of life. But in return for that, you don't really have freedom over the decisions that are made within the household. You don't get to decide uh, how the bills are spent, uh, what is done within the house when bedtime is as a child, but you'll be provided for. That's that kind of concept. Assimilation is this other concept. And this is when you force people to take on a culture that's not their own. We see this in the uh, in American history with uh, assimilation of Native Americans to uh, what's considered like modern American culture, but we also see this in the colonies, that uh, Native culture is seen as a bad thing, so it's expected to be shaken off in, uh, in lieu of a more European culture, in this case a French culture. Now we also have indirect control, and this was much more prevalent in British colonies. This is where you would have the local indigenous populations, they would keep leadership roles within the colony, but they would basically be dictated what the rules were from uh, the European country. So it was self-rule, but it was very, very limited. Okay? They handled the daily management, the kind of nitty gritty details, but the overarching plan for the direction of the colony uh, and how it would function was still controlled by the European power. And this was mainly because they wanted to make sure that they were developing future leaders to run the colony. So, for instance, the British would make sure um, that there was stability within their colony, but they still wanted the resources and the control over that territory. Now, as you can expect, this is a system that is not going to be one that the native peoples of these colonies are going to enjoy. We see a ton of different factors that lead to this. Nationalism is a big one. Okay, There's this loyalty to people that you're most similar to. And we start to see these national movements start to coalesce because they have a common enemy in their colonial master. We also see this point where we're getting to this concept of self-determination, that as a national unified group, you want to be able to make your own decisions, choose your own government, have the freedom to choose your path and future. And a lot of African countries try this at this point in time. And again, there's two that are successful in resisting uh, colonization at this point in time in the early 1900s with Ethiopia and Liberia, but for the most part, again, African nations uh, fail to resist imperialism, mainly due to the fact that Europeans just had more superior technology, advanced weaponry at this point in time, and the Europeans were able to also uh, play the rich diversity of Africa uh, as a dividing factor that it was hard to uh, have different groups within the colony work together. So again, when we look at the entire program of imperialism within Africa, there's a lot of things that come about because of this time period. It's very influential in the history of that continent. There's a ton of things that we can talk about from a negative perspective. There's also a few things we can discuss as positives. Now, because of the fact that the Europeans were industrialized, we see that a lot of kind of infrastructure type programs make their way to Africa. Things like increasing uh, sanitation and sewage, the creation of hospitals and schools, uh, railroads, dams, telephone lines, all are things that come into the colonies. The thing is, is that a lot of these 
things that are being built, they're mainly meant to benefit the Europeans. They're not meant to benefit the native Africans that are living in these colonies. Really what we see is the, the long-term negative effects. They are losing control of their land and they're losing independence. The, those that resist European imperialism are going to die as a result. Due to the management of the colonies, we see issues related to famine and disease. And again, that slow washing away of traditional cultures through assimilation. One of the other big and lasting things you can still see on a map today, which is the boundary lines of what will be the independent countries of Africa uh, moving into the second half of the 20th century and into the present. These boundary lines are still the same and the resulting uh, problems in the modern day are as a result of those lines we see future conflict. As you watch this video, we've got five questions here. Uh, in your notes, I'd like you to fill these out as you go. In the late 1800s, imperialist European nations gained control over much of Africa. Imperialism is the domination of one country's political, economic, or cultural life by another. European countries had been establishing colonies and building empires since the late 1400s. Imperialism brought wealth and power to Europeans. But the people living in colonies were often oppressed abused, and in some cases, even killed. In 40 years, Europe gobbled up virtually all of Africa south of the Sahara. It happened with tremendous speed, with tremendous brutality. The purpose of this conquest, like most conquests in history, was to make money for the conquerors. And they did so hand over fist and killed millions of people in the process. Most Europeans thought colonization was essentially a noble undertaking. After all, they said, Europeans had strong economies, well-organized governments, and powerful armies and navies. Meanwhile, African nations were troubled by economic weakness and political divisions. The transatlantic slave trade, which did not end until the 1800s, had drastically reduced the populations of African societies. The slave trade had also contributed to intertribal warfare. European power was fueled by the technology of the Industrial Revolution. New weapons and steam-powered locomotives and ships gave Europeans the ability to move quickly and fight wars with brutal efficiency. European manufacturers wanted access to natural resources such as rubber and petroleum. African colonies could also serve as vital ports for European merchant and naval ships. European missionaries urged Africans to give up their traditional beliefs and accept Western ways and religion. Missionaries opened hospitals and schools throughout the colonies. Sometimes, they also furthered the political and economic goals of imperialist nations. Many Europeans exploited and oppressed native Africans. Some of the worst oppression occurred in the Congo. King Leopold and other wealthy Belgians exploited the land and people of the Congo. African laborers were forced to harvest ivory and rubber. Conditions were so horrible that the populations of some areas declined drastically. Belgian exploitation of the Congo set off a scramble for colonies. Britain, France, and Germany rushed to make claims in the region. But Joseph Conrad, a British seaman, witnessed the horrors of imperialism in Africa and was moved to write a novel about the dark side of imperialism. Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness, is a story of a journey up a great river, deep into the Belgian Congo. A businessman named Marlowe is sent into the Congo to discover what has happened to a riverboat station chief named Kurtz. When Marlowe finally finds Kurtz, he is horrified by what he sees. Kurtz has gone insane he has set himself up as a kind of pagan god. He demands total obedience, and his reign brings death to the jungle. Conrad's novel brought the horrors of imperialism to life for European readers. 
but it did not end the scramble for colonies. By the early 1900s, only Liberia and Ethiopia had resisted European colonization. For the rest of Africa, there lay ahead a long and difficult struggle for independence. 